Few animals in the history of this planet could ever hope to meet the grandeur of the sauropods. Even among the dinosaurs, they were a clade all their own. The smallest among these creatures generally dwarfed everything in sight, and their vast sizes stretched the boundaries of how big life on Earth could become. Sauropods were widespread in their heyday, appearing on nearly every corner of the globe, being tentpole fauna wherever they were found. And one place on Earth that best exemplified this order was North America. The late Jurassic period was home to a plethora of these giants, from Brachiosaurus, Brontosaurus, Diplodocus, Chimerosaurus, and so on. And this rich diversity persisted into the Cretaceous, with the evolution of several new genera. But then, all of a sudden, once the late Cretaceous began, they just disappeared. Thus began the sauropod hiatus of North America. This was a period where no fossils of these great animals were found on the continent. This time lasted well into the late Cretaceous, and from the outset it seemed for a while that these dinosaurs would never again return to this continent. But then, when all hope seemed lost, in the latest stage of the Cretaceous period emerged a new sauropod by the name of Alamosaurus. This giant put an end to the hiatus, making sure there was a sauropod presence in America up until the extinction of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. Alamosaurus, in my view, was a seminal genera in the history of sauropods, and one of my personal favorite dinosaurs. So in this video, we'll go over where it came from, and how it lived in his home in Maastrichtian North America. But first we should discuss what could have caused the sauropod hiatus in the first place. As with many events of this nature, scientists don't exactly have one concrete answer, but rather several decently supported theories. Some of these ideas are as simple as not having enough well-preserved fossils in that mid to late Cretaceous area, or the fact that other species of herbivorous dinosaurs could have posed too much competition for the sauropods, effectively kicking them out of their niche. Specifically, many researchers referred to the hadrosaurs, a group that became especially prominent during the late Cretaceous. Some evidence pointing to these dinosaurs in particular becoming competition for sauropods come in the form that many of these last pre-hiatus sauropod fossils were found next to hadrosaur bones. This theory isn't without its skeptics. The main contention comes in the form of the fact that these two animals had two different methods of feeding, so direct competition wasn't really an issue there. After all, are zebras and antelopes, for example, competing with giraffes for the tops of trees? A better point would be that competition could occur for sauropods that have yet to be fully grown, and could only access those foods hadrosaurs would also be seeking. Well, that's definitely not out of the question, but there are, as many argue, a few more highly plausible theories. These include environmental changes that led to a decline in the preferential flora for existing American sauropods, as well as fluctuations in sea level, leading to a decline in habitats for the animals. And yeah, sea level fluctuations were definitely a major thing in the late Cretaceous. After all, that's the time where that big western interior seaway formed, effectively splitting the continent in two. Some scientists believe that these changes could have led to the end of lineages such as the Brachiosaurids and Diplodocids. But the Cretaceous saw a rise in a new group of sauropods, the Titanosaurus. As the name suggests, these monstrous animals were enormous, rivaling and often exceeding the sizes of many other genera that existed prior to them. Where we saw the decline of those older Jurassic sauropods, we see the spread of titanosaurs across various different continents. And at the 11th hour, it's believed that a line of one of these sauropods arrived in North America from South America, leading to the genus Alamosaurus evolving 70 million years ago. This is still a debated theory, but one with some evidence such as the existence of very closely related sauropod genera found in South America, such as Pelagrinosaurus, in addition to the similar emergence of hadrosaurs that were closely related to North American genera appearing in South America around the same time. It's kind of interesting that this is the second video in a row where we describe American exchanges like this. Alamosaurus belonged to the Saltosauridae family of Titanosaurus. These dinosaurs set themselves apart from others within the larger clade with the presence of 35 or fewer tailbones, which were convex on both sides. Within Saltosauridae, Alamosaurus often has been placed in the subfamily. All right, let me try this. Apisthecelacodonae. I hope I got that right. <laughs> where genera such as Pelagrinosaurus would also likely be found. And if you're interested in learning more about sauropod evolution, I can point you to this video right here. But let's get back to talking about Alamosaurus, of which there is currently only one known species, Alamosaurus sanjuanensis. Alamosaurus maintained the titanosaur body plane through and through. This included thick tree trunk-like legs, a gigantic neck that was about a third of the length of its entire body ending in a short head, 
and just proportions in general that were frankly ludicrous compared to other dinosaurs. This dinosaur measured 21 to 30 meters or about 69 to 98 feet long, was about 6.5 to 7 meters or about 21 to 23 feet tall at the shoulder, and with its neck extended, 12 to 13 meters or about 39 to 43 feet tall. Studies on its size put it anywhere from around 30 to 80 tons, or a bit over 66,000 pounds to a gargantuan over 186,000 pounds, putting it alongside some of the largest dinosaurs that ever lived such as Argentinosaurus. That latter size is a very high-end speculative estimate though, based on fragmentary remains. The average weight actually settles in a bit over 50 tons or 110,000 pounds. Even at that size, it was still the largest animal in North America by a comical margin. Seriously, nothing on the continent even came close. Beyond its already thick skin, the dinosaur was known to have been covered in osteoderms, bony deposits that acted as armor for the animal. Osteoderms were nothing new for titanosaurs. The closely related Saltosaurus was well known for being covered in them. Alamosaurus' osteoderms were thought to have covered its body, but also ran up its neck as well. Something that wasn't present in the animal, however, were nails on its forelimbs, which isn't unusual with Titanosaurus. Its front two feet, in life, would have probably just looked like giant block pillars. Alamosaurus was present on the eastern side of North America, on the continent of Laramidia. This dinosaur could be found in the southwest alongside a few different geological formations. During the Maastrichtian, these would be semi-arid plains around bodies of water such as rivers and lakes. There, they'd spend their days feeding on a variety of plant matter with their needle-shaped teeth. Given their long necks, stripping leaves from high-reaching trees would be no issue, and being the sole sauropod in the continent would leave it with no other species competing for the same food source. Interesting to note that these animals were found far more down south in the US, and were not found in that iconic Hell Creek formation. Perhaps the climate or vegetation wasn't suitable for the sauropod there, but current fossil evidence just doesn't show up in that region. Still, even in the places that it did live, Alamosaurus crossed paths with many iconic Cretaceous dinosaurs and other animals. These included Triceratops and Quetzalcoatlus, as well as Tyrannosaurus rex and Tyrannosaurus macroensis, if you see that as a distinct species. Now I know what a lot of you guys might be thinking, did T-Rex hunt Alamosaurus? Well, the answer to that is a resounding no, most likely. As we've said, Alamosaurus was the largest animal in North America during the Maastrichtian, and would have had no predators. Not even a T-Rex could take an animal of this size. It just didn't have the tools to tackle such prey. Let's look at some other theropod groups such as Allosaurids and Carcharodontosaurids that were known to have hunted sauropods. They had sharp serrated teeth, flexible necks, and wider gapes compared to Tyrannosaurus, which allowed them to tear flesh off their prey repeatedly until the animal was weakened by blood loss, at which point they could take down their prey. Some people refer to them as hit and run tactics, I just call them frauds and cowards, but I'm a huge sauropod fan, so what do I know? T-Rex, on the other hand, was far more of a brute force type predator. Its jaws had an insane bite force, the strongest of any land animal to have ever lived. But while this let it take on fortified, sturdy prey like Triceratops, it wasn't nearly as effective on a giant sauropod. For one, like we said before, their gapes just weren't as large. What uses a bite force that high when you can't even get your mouth around your target? Perhaps if T-Rex hunted in groups, something that there really isn't any evidence for, and if the Alamosaurus was crippled, sick, and dumb, maybe there'd be a chance. But in that case, we should also acknowledge that Alamosaurus could be found in herds, so there goes the number advantage. And sure, as with any animal, weak, old, and young members could be targets, but at that point, just go for a hadrosaur, man. It really isn't worth the effort. I realized that I spent a considerable time in a video about a completely different animal discussing T-Rex just now. But honestly, that's par for the course for YouTube paleo videos, right? The great thing about Maastrichtian fauna is that when it comes to their extinction, we don't have to make any wild guesses. Unfortunately, Alamosaurus met the same fate as so many iconic dinosaurs like T-Rex and Triceratops during the KPG extinction. But it's good to know that even in such a tragic event, sauropods were right alongside their other- Wait, that- oh, that's actually kind of dark. That's not- that's not hopeful at all. That's really morbid. I'm sorry. Hey guys, thanks for watching my video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to give it a like and make sure to subscribe. We're almost at 100,000 subscribers and I can't thank you guys enough. Let's keep at it and let's reach that number. Oh yeah, and before I go, this is just something I'm adding postscript, but if you guys have noticed that there's a lot of clips from Prehistoric Planet Seasons 1 and 2 here, 
Uh, I just want you guys to know that the trailer for the next season is likely to be releasing around this week or the following week. So whenever that happens, just expect an analysis video on that. I'll see you guys next time.